Selma. Our pilgrimage began in Selma, a city linked to the beginning of the famous march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Most of us uncertain what to expect and not personally connected or familiar with personal details. Yet, we were so blessed to be accompanied by Minister Glenda Strong Robinson, who had participated in the march in Memphis with Dr. Martin Luther King as a 14-year-old, and her sister, Madeline Strong Woodley. We gathered on our first evening at the By the River Center for Humanity, founded by Afrié We Can Do This, you have to imagine a large room, lovingly decorated with all things from thrift stores or finds along the street. From a bathtub filled with plants, photos of mostly unknown performers and activists, mirrors and sofas. Afrié had prepared a delicious meal for us and another traveling group of young people. And there was Joanne Bland, nearly 75 years old, and one of the well-known voices in the, right, in the fight for voting rights. She began telling her story, sitting on a comfortable armchair, commanding attention with her low voice and a twinkle in her eyes, calm, loving, and telling the truth. I became an activist at age 11 when I saw all those white kids sitting in the diner enjoying their ice cream, and I wanted so badly to sit there too. I was so angry. I wanted to hit somebody. And then I had to learn that I could protest, needed to protest, but not to hit back. I marched with my sisters across that bridge, and I saw what happened. Since then, I have never stopped working on equal rights and voting rights, and I am so worried that we are going backwards now that we are losing those rights. Deep sadness and yet hope for the future and the faith in love filled the room. Minister Glenda then introduced herself and the two exchanged with great joy all the names of people they both had known and held dear in their hearts. After this, Afrié took over a woman who is giving her life to tell the story of slavery in an unflinching, truthful way. The theme of faith, love, and hope was at the center of her sermon. She taught us how to love ourselves, the only way to enable us to give love to others. She left us with the joy of loving ourselves singing and dancing into the night in Selma. The next morning, we were guests at the Tabernacle Church, a building with two like entrances, the one from the main street, permitting blacks only to use it as an exit in a funeral procession, and the one from the minor street for regular entrance for black attendance we heard a moving, eloquent appeal for standing up for equal political rights, always carried by the need for social justice. Members of the congregation there served us a wonderfully prepared fried chicken with corn and greens. From, these, uh, from there, we walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge across the Alabama River. We remembered the march, halted by a wall of state troopers, all white Christians, with clubs and bullwhips, 
sheriff's deputies on horseback, and white citizens who had come to cheer them on. When the marchers were told to turn back, they stood their ground. The troopers advanced, knocked the marchers to the ground, surrounded them with a cloud of tear gas, and brutally beat them. On the bloody Sunday, many, including John Lewis, were so badly beaten, they were taken to the hospital. When the demonstrators retreated, they lay on the ground in pain and despair. Minister Glenda guided us in a reenactment of that experience. In a small park on the other side of the bridge, with some of us lying on the ground and moaning. The sound of the moaning grew in volume and intensity until it turned on that Sunday and in our midst. To singing, it became a freedom song, which gave the marchers the courage and resolve they needed to go back days later for a second and final third march under federal protection. And it filled our hearts with a deep appreciation for the incredible courage of the marchers. Minister Glenda ended the reflection with a prayer and the repeated saying, freedom costs, freedom costs, a message that has been deeply embedded in me since and rings true, especially in our time. For a German like me, it is a stark reminder that being quiet in the face of evil can never be an option. God be with us this morning. Water was ever present during our pilgrimage to Alabama. The first day we reached the center of Selma at twilight and saw the iconic Edmund Pettus Bridge in the golden light. The next day we walked across that bridge that spanned the muddy Alabama River, our first introduction to water. On the last day of our pilgrimage, we would walk to the port on the same river where ships delivered slaves by tens of thousands to be auctioned in the heart of the city of Montgomery. Amos 5:24. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. Well, in Selma, we keenly felt the presence of Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. I remember Dr. King's mountaintop speech while visiting the Brown Chapel AME Church. In his speech, he responded to Bull Connor's call to turn the fire hoses on them by remembering his baptism, the ritual. And he wrote, and we went before the fire hoses. We had known water. If we were Baptist or some other denominations, we had been immersed. If we were Methodist or some others, we had been sprinkled, but we knew water. That couldn't stop us. On our first evening in Montgomery, we met outside next to the swimming the hotel swimming pool because our meeting room was too small. But it was God's plan. We were put there for another pur purpose altogether, soon to be revealed. A young man approached us asking if we were a prayer group. Yes, we could be a prayer group. We welcomed him in. He shared the burdens that weighed on him and asked for our prayers for God to help him overcome, which he couldn't do on his own. One of his parents was white and one was black, and he was searching for his identity. 
we laid hands on him and asked God to be with this young man and called on Jesus to walk with him and always be by his side. This is what God had called us to do that evening above all else. It seemed to be a pivotal moment for our visitor and for our group as well. We don't always know what God will call us to do, so be ready, be present to answer the call, even when your chapel is a swimming pool. John 7, 38. Who believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. The slave's journey too began with water. We got a glimpse of that, what their passage was like upon entering the Legacy Museum in Montgomery. In a darkened room, we were faced with a large format video that conveyed the fury of the monstrous waves that broke loudly, relentlessly. It was terrifying. Their capture violently upended their lives. They were never to return again. The sadness was overwhelming too. I thought I had understood what these Africans had endured, but I had never felt it in my bones before. The terror, the panic, the dread, the inhumanity, it was overwhelming. And the journey, my journey, was just beginning. Mother Teresa was said, may my heart break so completely that the whole world falls in. Outside the museum was a long, narrow, reflecting pool with sculptures, the heads and shoulders of Africans, a man, a woman, and a child emerging from the water the spot offered a place to rest and contemplate all we had seen and experienced inside the museum. Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a river of water, of life, bright as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. While walking in the city center, we passed an ornate water fountain the very spot had been the site of numerous slave auctions. Artwork painted on the pavement around the fountain recalled the former purpose of this location, and a statue of Rosa Park gazed in the direction of the fountain to show that she too had been there and left a mark that could not be washed away. Wade in the water, Wade in the water, children. Wade in the water. God is going to trouble the water. We sang these words in other spirituals when we gathered. How could I not think of Minty Harriet Tubman, known as the conductor of the Underground Railroad? She bravely escaped slavery, then returned time and time again to shepherd others on their way to freedom. They often crossed the water to evade recapture, wading in the water with prayers that God would muddy the waters to help cover the path of their escape. Several years ago, I visited the Harriet Tubman National Historic Park in Auburn, New York. The small museum was informative and the tour outstanding. When we walked down the road and entered the little house that was Harriet, Tub Harriet Tubman's home, it was small and simple. I remember gazing fondly at the little bed that she slept in, wanting to remember that moment forever. Traveling to these historic places connects us viscerally to the incredible people that we have come to know while studying the darker side of the history of our country. 
Before our trip, I had read that white settlers had systematically removed native peoples from the land, had also systematically imported African slaves to grow cotton. Legacy of manifest destiny. We haven't moved far from this slave economy our forebears created, but have farmed it out to workers overseas where there is less scrutiny of child labor, slavery, or unsafe working conditions far enough away that we don't have to see it. Stand Up by Joshua, Brian Campbell, and Cynthia Enviro. I'm going to stand up, take my people with me. Together, we are going to a brand new home far across the river. Can you hear freedom calling? Calling to answer, calling me to answer. Going to keep on keeping on. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice, also known informally as the National Lynching Memorial, commemorates black victims of lynching in the United States. We gathered outside near a wall inscribed with names of lynching victims that begged us to read each one. Water flowed over the wall, washing over the names, perpetually baptizing each one. More than 4,400 African American men, women, and children were hanged, burned alive, shot, drowned, and beaten to death by white mobs between 1877 and 1950. Millions more fled the South as refugees from racial terrorism, profoundly impacting the entire nation. This was a sacred space for truth-telling and reflection. After walking past and through dozens and dozens of slabs organized by state and county, inscribed with the names of those who had been lynched, we came to a place where the water again flowed over a wall with words of hope. I don't think I was the only one thinking of the words of the anthem, anthem Roll Down Justice by Mark A. Meyer. There's a voice strong and clear, ringing out far and near, let justice roll down. Let justice roll down. Like the rush of a stream comes a powerful dream. Let justice roll down. Justice roll down. I was asked by fellow pilgrims to share that many black people in our country are afraid of the water. In the South, segregation applied to swimming pools, which meant that black people didn't have access to learn how to swim. This practice followed the Great Migration North from 1910-1970 as black people escaped the threat of violence and death by lynching in the South. In the South, a black person could be beaten or killed just for drinking water fountain reserved for white people. Water injustice continues in our country Contaminated water flowing through lead-lined pipes in Flint, Michigan continues to be an issue nine years after the governor switched the Detroit water system to water from the Flint River. The water system in Jackson, Mississippi, is one of the oldest in our country. In August of 22, flooding on the Pearl River caused the city to close its water treatment plant indefinitely affecting 150,000 people. Since 2018, the city of Jackson has had over 300 boil water notices and suffered over 7,300 water line breaks. These communities have been victims of injustice for decades due to policies that marginalize people of color when it comes to social services such as education and housing. In recent decades, communities and urban areas have fallen victim to environmental justice and have been negatively impacted by the lack of attention state policymakers give to environmental crisis and marginalized communities. 
Last October, the EPA announced it would investigate whether Jackson had handled federal funds in a way that discriminated against its residents. The investigation came in response to a federal complaint the NAACP filed last September in which a group alleged that the Mississippi officials had all but assured drinking water calamity in Jackson while depriving the state's capital of badly needed funds to upgrade its infrastructure. In the words, the Lakota phrase, mini wishoni, meaning water is life, was the protest anthem for Standing Rock, heard around the world, but it also has a spiritual meaning rooted in indigenous worldviews. For Native Americans, water does not only sustain life, but is also sacred. Isaiah 44, 3 to 4. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and the streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendant. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. May it be so. When you first walk into the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, you pass signs describing the history of how slavery morphed into brutality and exploitation in new forms following the Civil War. Convict leasing, sharecropping, Jim Crow laws, and lynchings. One statement from those signs particularly impacted me. Lynchings in America were not isolated hate crimes committed by rogue vigilantes. Lynchings were targeted racial violence, perpetrated to uphold an unjust social order. Lynchings were terrorism. I hadn't previously understood the pervasiveness and intentionality behind the violence. For example, there were lynchings that were advertised in the newspaper in advance. White people came from the surrounding area to attend. There were food vendors. They brought their children. And they took pictures with the victims. The memorial also lists some of the reasons given for the lynchings, and here are a few. Frank Dodd was lynched in DeWitt, Arkansas in 1916 for annoying a white woman. Elizabeth Lawrence was lynched in Birmingham, Alabama in 1933 for reprimanding white children who threw rocks at her. Grant Cole was lynched in Montgomery, Alabama in 1925 after he refused to run an errand for a white woman. Take a minute. Check in on how you're feeling. Are you angry? Are you sad? Do you feel defensive? Do you feel hopeless? 
Maybe it's too much to feel at all. This truth is hard to look in the face. But if we don't have the courage to see the truth, then that rot, that shame of dehumanizing our black siblings will keep infecting our culture. Holy Week came alive for me in a different way after this trip. The night before Jesus dies, he tells his disciples that they will all desert him. And Peter says, no way. Even if everyone else leaves you, I never will. And Jesus tells them that before the rooster crows, Peter will deny him three times. So then Jesus gets arrested. He's undergoing a sham trial because he is upsetting the status quo and the leaders who are trying to appease the oppressive powers above them. And they're looking for a reason to hand Jesus over to be lynched. Peter is hanging out in the courtyard of the house, trying to follow what's going on. And three people come up to him and say, hey, weren't were you, you one of those guys with Jesus? And Peter lies and says, no, no, three different times. And then the rooster crows. He remembers Jesus' words to him, and the Gospels say Peter went out and wept bitterly. That line jumped out at me. I feel for Peter. I imagine he was really scared. So he lied to save himself. And then he realizes what he has done. Out of fear, he betrayed his teacher and friend, and he weeps bitterly. I think we all spent some time weeping bitterly in Alabama. As we confronted the truth of our country's history, and the betrayal that has happened again and again to our black siblings. Maybe you all feel some of that same weight. I want to tell you what else I encountered in Alabama. I found the gospel, the good news, come to life in the civil rights movement. In response to a society that used terror to enforce a dehumanizing and unjust social order, the black community chose to tell the truth by showing the world how much more humane, how much more human they treated their neighbors in their nonviolent fight for freedom. The foot soldiers of the civil rights movement paid the cost of freedom with their sweat, with incarceration, with their livelihoods, and with their lives sometimes, but not with the price of their humanity. When you live in an unjust system, there is a real cost to speaking truth to power. But there is also a high cost for not telling the truth. There is the brutal high cost on our black siblings. There is also the high cost on our humanity, our souls, if you will, when we remain silent in the face of injustice. Maybe you know these words from Martin Luther King Jr.'s last speech, the night before a white supremacist shot him in Memphis, Tennessee. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Until this trip, I hadn't really been able to reconcile Jesus' seemingly contradictory statements, that I will find rest for my soul if I take up his yoke, because it is easy and his burden is light and the contrasting command to take up my cross daily and follow him. Carrying a cross has always sounded like a heavy burden to me. <laughs> but I'm beginning to believe that in this unjust, broken world, I can live in fear and let things be as they are, or I can live in love and challenge that injustice. Both have a cost, but the cost of fear is higher. We did a lot of crying in Alabama but we also did a lot of singing. We sang about freedom in a church, in a park, 
by a hotel pool and a restaurant and a museum cafe. And Peter weeping bitterly is not the end of the story. He and his friends are lost and grieving after Jesus dies. So they go fishing. And the resurrected Jesus shows up on the shore. And Peter jumps out of the boat and runs to him. And Jesus doesn't condemn or scold Peter. He offers forgiveness. And he puts him to work. Jesus asks Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? And when Peter says yes, Jesus tells him to feed his sheep. I believe our calling as a church in the face of injustice, even after past betrayals, is no different. Church, do you love Jesus? Then feed his sheep. Care for, stand with, love your neighbors.